I remember I was watching The Color Purple and um, and I kept seeing these photographs. Um, the part where like Celie, like she almost falls onto the rock and then she runs away and you just see this bloody handprint mm -hmm. on the rock. And I was like, that right there, that's a photograph and it's telling me a story. You know, there's something about it that makes me wonder what happened before, what's about to happen and what was this moment about right here? To this day, I always, I still look for that composition, that 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 mm -hmm. balance of the frame, that 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 photograph. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That like, how can I find the photograph here? Where's the still image that tells me the story of what's going on? If someone was watching this on mute and they saw this, right. it would make them be like, wait, 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 turn that up. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is a podcast on directing for anybody that's quite simply ever watched anything. Pete converses with a wide range of fellow directors, writers, actors, showrunners, producers, executives, and more on a journey to determine just what makes a good director and why we'll always need stories. The Director is Pete Chapman's digital studio, built on the pillars of craftsmanship that ensure a unique vision. I'm talking about story, innovation, perspective. Learn more about the director, and better yet, get your official director's chair wear by visiting www.drctr.video. That's drctr.video. All right, welcome to episode 33 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Today's guest will be Crystal C. Roberson. Uh, an amazing director and friend. She is currently uh, serving as the producing director and co-executive producer on ABC's Queens, uh, which shoots uh, down in Atlanta. And we have a wonderful conversation about her journey going from uh, photographer and, and just work, uh, being interested in stories as a, as a kid uh, to being a photographer in Georgia to uh, doing people's headshots to being a PA in the industry, a director's assistant and uh, in what some might call a meteoric rise but what we all know is the 10 plus year overnight success that it really takes in this game. Uh, she's made quite a transition to directing episodes of All American, uh, Diary of a Future President, the aforementioned Queens, uh, as well as Long Slow Exhale, which we uh, actually were shooting. Uh, she handed the baton to me uh, on episodes that I shot back in uh, July and August of 2021. So we've got a great interview. As always, before we dive in, I'll just catch you up. We have shot two days on uh, episode 102 of Reasonable Doubt, and it's been going quite well. This is the first episode that I'm directing. Um, getting great performances, you know, I can't give you too, too much information, but um, what I will say is that it's pretty awesome to be shooting in you know, less explored black neighborhoods in LA um, and putting a really interesting lens on the lives of black women and men in, uh, in this part of the city. So I know that's pretty vague and cryptic, but um, more to come on that. Uh, what else do we got? What else do we got? Uh, that's pretty much it because I find I'm finding that it's an all inclusive job being a, a producing director. You're involved in obviously directing your own episodes, but you're also involved behind the scenes uh, in prep for the next director. In fact, uh, just this week, Nima Barnett started prep. And so, uh, you know, I'll get my chance to kind of talk with her and answer any questions. And so, um, it's great because you have much more information from which to approach your creative um, strokes with the with the episode. Um, but you are definitely managing a lot more, which is which is the cool challenge. And I think it's a it's a great opportunity because there are things now that I know um, going into production that in a typical scenario I would just be hearing at the end of the telephone line, the end, at the end of the telephone game, rather. So Crystal and I will chat about that to some degree, and uh, I hope y'all enjoy. So 
without further ado, episode 33 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman, starring Crystal C. Roberson. Roll sound. Speed. The interview. Take one. Action. Tell me about Clarity Jane. Oh, Clarity Jane. What does it mean? Who is it? Like, what is that? Yeah, so so here's the thing. So when I started in film, I started off as a photographer. And mm-hmm. I've been taking pictures since high school. And, and then I went to college and I was taking pictures of like my friends and a couple of friends' weddings. And I was like the campus photographer. So I started this thing called Crystal Clear Photography. And I have been going by Crystal Clear for, you know, a long time. A lot of my close friends just call me Clear. Um, And then the clear of it all really evolved within me, like into clarity. Like, what is that? Mm. Because I was like, Crystal Clear, like, what is that really saying? What is it other than like a gimmicky name, right? And it's always been, I've always had a, a search for clarity in my life, in my work, in my vision. Um, and, um, I always admire like people like Erica Badu, who like mm-hmm. Erica has like 10, 20 different names. Right. Right. Like, just, right. If you know, you know, you know what I mean? So it's that sort of thing. It's totally that thing. Yeah. And so where did you, since we're talking about that, where did you go to, uh, where did you go to college? Where, where are you shooting all these photos? Yeah, so when I grew up in Macon, Georgia, um, the same town as Otis Redding, James Brown, Mm. um, and that's where I started taking photos. I was working at this mom and pop camera shop called um, Coke's Camera, and that's where I learned about cameras. I learned how to sell cameras and film and develop film, Um, and then I went to Valdosta State University, which is in South Georgia, like right above Florida, and that's where I was like, doing photography and headshots and I was that go-to girl like if you wanted some pictures on camera on campus I was always walking around with a camera um and then that's also where I my love for photography evolved into like my love for motion photography and film and that's where I fell in love with filmmaking was like in college right around my sophomore year Uh, I was just about to drop out because I was like, this ain't for me. (laughs) But what about um, it? What about it wasn't for you? Like, what was it something that wasn't being fulfilled? Like what, what, because that's a big, I know a lot of times you have the pressures of family telling or, or just society saying you got to go to college and do that. Like what made you say, "Eh, I don't know. Yeah, I think it was, I, I was under some family pressure. It was like, you should go for business. Everything is a business, you know, go be a business student. And the classes just weren't, it wasn't the way that my mind worked. It wasn't exciting to me. I was like, okay, so I got to do this for the next four years of my life. Like it just wasn't anything that seemed like what I wanted to do. Um, And then once I I kind of switched without anybody knowing, without my family Mm. knowing, I switched majors, which I think a lot of film students, um, I think it's a lot of our origin stories out there. Like you switch majors to try it out. And when I did that, like, it was like, oh my gosh, I came to life. This is where I'm supposed to be. I was in front of the class. I went Mm. from almost failing to like a 4.0, Cause I was just so excited about it, you know, and I was all my teacher's favorite. Like, like, I was like, yeah, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be right here. So um, my mom didn't care once she saw my grade, she was like, okay, all right, good. You know, but yeah, it was like, it was a big moment of self-discovery right there in college. Just like, that's when you question, you know, what you want to do, who are you, what do you really believe in, you've been going with your parents or whoever all this time, whatever they believe, and that's when you really know, like, okay, no, this is who I am, and this is what I want to do, you know, yeah. What, what kind of, um, so I've, I've, I had my grandmother lived in Birmingham, Alabama, and then uh, later got remarried and lived uh, most of the rest of her life in Columbus, Georgia, 
So I never actually went to like had any, I drove through making, never kind of went there, but like mm -hmm. um, what kind of value system was built for you as a kid growing up there? You know what Macon did for me? Um, I will say just having Southern folk like as my family and as my friends. Um, to this day, I feel like I still have a certain understanding of what just good old like down home people want, what they want right. to watch. Right. Those are the people who are really watching a lot of television um, and films and movies. Like I think about those people when I'm shooting. Mm -hmm. um, I mm. think about like just folks who've never stepped foot on a set. Cause you know, it can become, as you know, like, we, we form these circles, we're all in this together. And after a while, it starts to feel like everybody's in the business, right? Right. But right. everybody's not in the business. Most people are not in the business. They've right. never seen it. They don't even know what it looks like. They are sitting there watching your television show or your movie because right. they really want to see your show or your movie right. in, in your story. So I think about those people. It keeps me grounded to a certain extent where it's like you know where you come from you know who you're making this for right um and you understand real people you know what and I there's mean? And, and there's no judgment right because there's a lot of stuff that like you know like I'm a I'm a film school guy like I'm, I'm like yo you got that criterion collection kurosawa you know what I mean like right, but, right. you know whether it's film or tv like yeah. the and I'm not casting any aspersions on any shows but like there's like, a, there are shows that I don't watch, like let's say Blue Bloods that mm -hmm. are on all day long and everyone all everywhere is long. watching it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, even now, like with a with a kid, like we we go to, you know, watch something at the end of the day. And I'm like, yeah, I want some shit that's, you know, not going to be too much thinking, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I, wanna, <laughs> yeah. I can look up every now and then be like, oh, they blew up the car. I get it, you know? Um, and while it's yeah. not my sole taste, like you begin to uh, have an appreciation like you're talking about for yeah. the types of content people like. Exactly. Exactly. And it's like different, you know, diff at different phases in your life, you like different things. And like you said, mm -hmm. like when you got a lot going on, you want to escape. You want yeah. something you don't to think too hard about or when you don't have that much going on, you want something that's going to fulfill you and feed you and feed your mind and make you think. And, right. you know, I, I've, I know all those different types of people. You now, it, it sounds like with, uh, and tell me if I'm, if I'm on making it a bit of a stretch here, but let me actually, let me not make a stretch. Let me ask a question. Okay, okay. <laughs> is, is, there, is there any part, because it sounds like you're very entrepreneurial. Uh, from an early age with even your photo your photography hustle, was there something about where you grew up that kind of, you know, bled into that? Like what, cause not a lot of people are like, yeah, I was, I was around doing this. I was selling that. Like I, I had a production company, like I was doing, <laughs> you know, videos for car dealers and like, what, what was that? I, you know what, honestly, I think it came from the fact that I was from a small town and I had no idea what I was doing and I didn't have anyone to say, hey, here's what you do. So mm -hmm. I think there's a freedom in that. It may seem like a limitation, but there's a freedom in that because then you just start to carve your own path. You start to just do what you think you're supposed to be doing, right. <laughs> even if you have no clue what you're doing. Um, because there's nobody there to say, this is the way that you do this. I think that if there were somebody from Macon that I could look at and say, okay, this is how I do it. I probably would have done it that exact same way. Cause I would have been like, as a youngster, I would have been like, okay, this is how you do it. Let me do the same thing. But there was nobody. Um, right. So for me, I was just like, okay, I'm going to just figure this out. I knew that photography made me feel a way that nothing else made me made me feel. Um, mm -hmm. I know that it put me in a certain space that nothing else on earth had ever done. And it was inexplainable. And I was like, okay, something. there's something with this. And I just stuck with it because that's where my heart was anyway. It's what I love to do. Um, 
And it, and it just started to, and I mean, you know, the need for money, like being <laughs> a broke college student, you start to figure out like, okay, how can I sell this, these right. photos? How can I figure out how to get a little extra money on the side right. doing this? You know, I think, you know, like they say, necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, th- I mean, this is uh, I'm going to make a mental note that I have two questions that I want to come back to about photography and mm-hmm. filmmaking. But like, I love hearing this because it's, you know, I met you. I don't know when I met you, but like, I don't know either. <laughs> I've been knowing you forever. <laughs> but like, the, but the, I think the first in-person meeting was like when when it was what was that 2016, maybe on the Greenleaf thing. Was that the first time we met in person? Perhaps, uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I don't know. That's the that's yeah. I don't know, Pete. I think maybe, maybe so. Yeah, because before that, maybe it was all online, and yeah, I feel like we had to run into each other at like a film festival or something. The community is is yeah. is not that large, right? But yeah. what, but but it's it's dope hearing this because it's like okay, like there was always a a vision you know what i mean because like and, and we'll talk more about like your resume and like everything and how you got to where you are now but it's like i could see like oh you were learning you were assisting these people but never really looking or or giving off assistant while at the same time not giving off stepping stone you know what i mean like these are these are hard things to like to thread and and i think along the way you see a lot of folks um step in the fucking mud because they're doing one job and uh performing for another and people end up resenting that you know um so that's that's more commentary but um yeah no i hear you though i hear you the, the question is um when what so it's two parts what was it about the moving image that triggered you in comparison to the you know single frame by frame of a photo of a photograph and then uh how did your photography skill set inform your directing um so for me so the first question for me they merged into one you know they merged into one. It was like, I remember I was watching the color purple and um, and I kept seeing these photographs. Um, the part where like Celie, like she almost falls onto the rock and then she runs away and you just see this bloody handprint mm-hmm. on the rock. And I was like, that right there, that's a photograph and it's telling me a story. You know, there's something about it that makes me wonder what happened before what's about to happen and what was this moment about right here and 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 when i realized like oh the photography that tells a story the mm-hmm. image that that makes you wonder what happened before what happened after or the image that magically tells you what happened before and after um in one image that's the stuff that like it just lit my soul on fire and i was right. like okay so it's motion photography. Um, And I was like, okay, wow. And then they sort of just merged and filmmaking made my photographs better because I began to look for those stories, those images in my still photography. I I wanted, well, I started taking a lot of candids Mm -hmm. um around campus and stuff because I was like I want to tell a story with it like that's what made me like just be like it was just really exciting to me that I could savor one moment and tell the story of that moment forever um and I think that with motion photography in terms of me being a photographer um to this day I always I still look for that composition that 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 mm-hmm. balance of the frame that 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 photograph you know mm-hmm. what I mean that like how can I find the photograph here where's the still image that tells me the story of what's going on if someone was watching this on mute and they saw this right. what would make them be like wait 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 turn that up turn that right. up you know what I'm saying so do you ever but, think like yeah. what would be the thumbnail for this episode on like you know, yeah. Hulu or Netflix, like what would be the thing that they're going to select to represent 
these 44 minutes or these 22 minutes, you know? Exactly, exactly. And I, I think that images are powerful in that way where you can see one thing and wonder like, what's this about? Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, they just kind of like, they beautifully merged in my life as one thing and one helped the other and the other mm -hmm. helped the other. And they still are doing the same thing. I haven't taken a lot of, like, I haven't been taking a lot of photos, um, but, um, you know, I fell out of it when it all went digital, you know what I'm saying? I fell out of it a little bit and I got left behind, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you you can't fight the evolution of cinema and photography and technology. You can't right. fight it. You can't sit back and be a Southern girl and be like, oh, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you will get left behind. So I was trying to fight it. Like, no, you know, people with digital cameras are cheating. You know, you don't know how to take manual photos. And I was a bit of a snob in that way. And when I tell you all my little business trickled on out the door, like I got left behind. I stopped making money as a photographer. Um, what year? What year was this? That was right when I graduated college, like probably either my last year or the year after, because I, okay. I remember um, it was probably the last year of college. Okay. And that makes me feel old, but yeah, that's <laughs> like the digital revolution. Like but, when all the, it wasn't like the first digital camera, but it was like when all the cameras were digital right. and all your photos would be there instantly. And, you know, right. it was like widespread. Everybody was getting them. Everybody was getting the cameras, you know. It was, it was, it was a sea change. You know what I mean? Cause like, I remember you know, going from film to video. So then it was like, we had like the HVX 200 and the Panasonic 24P cameras and all these things. And then yep. the big C change was, yo, I got a 7D, I got a 5D. I'm like, you shooting video with a camera? Like, that sounds, that sounds weird, man. And then like, I hopped on that bandwagon and I was like, oh shit, like this is crazy. Now the cameras would overheat after a 10 minute clip. So they had like their own, like, like, uh, challenges but yeah man it's 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 wild and even now like things happen where you know the way the effects are being accomplished changes season to season when some new technology comes out and it's like we got to pivot yeah absolutely and i think do you feel like you're expected to kind of know all of these things mm -hmm. as a working director like things are changing year to year but you're supposed to just step in there and just already uh, know it i've <laughs> i've found like so that's that's a great question. I, I I think in my early episodes, I thought I was expected to know and I would feel inadequate if I didn't. And I would probably try and mask it. Then I saw like, well, if I'm, I'm not really masking it because because <laughs> I got nothing to add to these conversations. Um, so then I started being like, look, uh, explain this to me like I'm in like I'm five years old because I don't totally understand what we're doing here technically, but I know the story I want to tell. So maybe you can help me do that. And and then some of the best VFX things I ever did were once I opened up to, to that exposure. But that's yeah. that became being confident in knowing that I don't have to know everything. But yes. I have found time. That, that comes with time. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think the more you do know, the more likely, ah, damn, I don't even know if I want to say it like that. I was going to say the more likely the vision will be what you intended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's stepping on the idea of collaboration. Because, But I think the more you know about each of those little things, the more intricate you can get. Because I know you've yeah. seen things where you're like, a DP might tell you, oh, that we can't get that shot or we can't do it like this. And you're like, you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can. I I did that on a short film and it works. You know what I mean? And, and sometimes it totally it's that. Work. Yeah. 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 I remember making some cereal float one time. I was like, the cereal is going to float out of the box. They were like, dude, how are we going to do that? And um, I was like, this is how we're going to do it. And <laughs> we did it. And we we looped some Fruit Loops onto <laughs> some, some damn fishing line. And we made that cereal flow, you know what I mean? And it was all about just the hand movement of, at you know, over the frame, 
right. of how realistic it looked. It was less about the gag and more about our performance with the string. Right. But, um, but you know, yeah, like you, you always, there's always a way when you know, when you don't know, you are kind of at the mercy of the people who do know, because they're able to right. say, this isn't possible. And there's no way for you to be like, aha, it is possible, you know. Yeah. And then you don't know what they're, you know, and I don't mean to cast fear for anybody listening, but sometimes you don't know who's on your team and who's saying something's not possible because they don't want it to be possible for you. For you. you know what I mean? And so that, that's why I advocate for at some point, at least being in route to knowing a little bit about everything. So you can play a little defense on your creative uh, uh, ideas. You know, I just did something where um, it's funny because it was it was very it was very surreal, right? And so once you get off the page, and you, word choice becomes really important. And I remember watching this video on cinematography coming up where they talked about the opening of Forrest Gump. And how like you got to say the exact thing you mean for 20 people to go do what you want to do to that feather floating yes. through the wind. Like you can't say pan up. You can't say tilt left. Right. And these are things I hear on set. Now, right. Yeah. And so it, I was like, man, yeah, you got to know the language. And like the, the DP talked about, like, you'll hear somebody say, OK, I want to follow. Um, I want to follow um, the character. Right. And so this shot was set up, boom, director came back, they're ready to shoot. And they're like, wait, why are you on her back? And they're like, you said follow. Said follow. And they're like, oh, I wanted, oh no, I want to be in front of her. I was like, well, that's leading. You yeah. know what I mean? And like, but if, if there's so many pitfalls on that. Um, yeah, So absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've definitely um, learned how to, I guess, it, like be more way more specific um with the way that I describe shots to DPs I think that um you know in some ways like you want to be collaborative right so you don't want to just try to spell it all out right but I think what I've grown to know is that it's better to spell it all out and then allow them to collaborate from that point Mm -hmm. um, because if you try to like leave things open for interpretation, that's what will happen. And then, and then you're shot <laughs> going somewhere off the rails. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. We gotta, yeah. we gotta agree that we're making a, a five bedroom house before mm -hmm. you start offering, well, what if it was a townhouse or I'm thinking skyscraper. It's like, no, right. five bedroom house now collaborate. Right. <laughs> um, so let, let's get to the point where you, you've you made this transition, the clients have walked out of the door because uh, you were you were a, a, a photography snob. <laughs> and now, now you're, uh, you've got your eye on being behind the camera of the moving image. Um, how did you get to your first episode? And don't feel the need to abbreviate that into some like, you know, elevator pitch, like, because I know when people ask me that, I might be like, yo, you ready? Because I'm about to tell you a, a, a 11 year journey. But like, I asked the question to find out like, how you would relay that, that, that path. <clears throat> um, okay, I will say it's not an elevator pitch, but for my brain is three different, it's in three different sections, right? Or three different layers. On one layer, which was the real me, I, Crystal, was always making short films. Like, no matter how horrible they were, I would get with my, I was, I was a production assistant for a little while before I became an assistant. And I would always make a short, I was that PA that was like saving up my little $500 checks. <laughs> Because we didn't get paid the way PAs get paid <laughs> these days. Like, okay. So right. like I was saving up my little coins and I would spend it on, on shooting movies, buying some pizza for the crew, whatever. I was the girl who, so on one layer, I'm always shooting short films on the weekends or whatever. On this layer, I'm working in the film industry. I'm going from show to show, job to job, freelance, um, I'm finding and talking to people on set. 
who, Mm -hmm. you know, the camera loader who wants to be a DP and the costume PA who wants to be a designer and the prop PA who wants to be a prop master. And I'm talking to all these people like, hey, you know, on the weekends, we get to be whatever we want to be. Like, I want to direct. Do you want to be my DP? Do you want to be my costume designer? And then before I knew it, I had all hands on deck. Like, yeah, let's do it. Let's make shorts on the weekends. And it would be different crews. I did have one DP, Ross Shebek, who, um, shout out to Ross. He mm-hmm. did DP a lot of my early, early shorts. A lot of the bad ones. The, like, <laughs> just, you know, and <clears throat> so I was, I was, shooting shorts. I was working as a PA in the industry. I became an assistant in the industry. And when, and I I assisted for probably too long. I assisted for a very long time, but. Now you assisted directors? I assisted directors. Yeah. Directors. Sometimes every now and then I would get like a showrunner or a writer or a producer, but most, for the most part, it was directors. Um, Mm -hmm. I was working when I became an assistant I was actually working with Rob Hardy and Will Packer at Rainforest Films. I was their executive assistant. I was in the office all the time and I knew that wasn't for me, even though I knew it was an amazing opportunity to be working with Rob and Will. And so, but it got to that point where I had to talk with them and I was like, hey, I have to get back on set. Like that's that's where I belong. Mm-hmm. I'm a director, like I, I have to get back on set. And they understood that and they helped me do that. Um, and I, you know, st- I, I became an assistant. And after a while of doing that, shooting shorts, putting them in some small festivals, I won some awards here and there, you know, always getting a lot of encouragement from a film community in Atlanta. Um, mm-hmm. And it got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm a director. Like I have to stop being an assistant to directors. I'm a director. And, and I had to get aggressive about it because no one is going to suddenly look at you and say, Hey, Crystal, it's your time now. Don't you want to stop doing this and do this instead? Especially when you are good at your job, they, you know, no fault to them. They just want, they love you and they love what you bring to their team. But um, so they're never going to say, Hey, you should move on from right. being my assistant. Like, go take this, go take this great work elsewhere right. and leave right. me to find someone who will never do it as well. Who will never do it as well. <laughs> as, like, and that's where I was. I was on Greenleaf, um, assisting the producing director and, I had done that for two years and going into the third year, the third season, I was like, okay, mind you, um, even the first season, I was already almost 10 years into being an assistant. I had been an assistant way too long. Okay. Even, you know, yeah, I was shooting films at the same time, but it was still way too long. So going into that third year, I was like, guys, I said, you know, (laughs) look, I'm a director. I was like, I would be happy to still be on this Greenleaf team, but I need A, B, and C to happen. Um, I want an episode. I want, like, can I shoot some inserts? Like, what y'all, you know, like, I had to be aggressive and say, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Whenever there was something that came in from post that, and they were like, hey, we're missing this shot. I had to be right there. Like, I can do it. I can shoot it. Let me shoot right. it. You don't have time to shoot it. Just let me do it. And right. that went against who I am. Cause I'm not that sort of aggressive, put me on, put me on type of girl. Right. I right. can be really kind of introverted, quiet. Mm-hmm. When you get to know me, I'm silly and loud, but not like that. So I had to become someone who I wasn't, you know, and be like, put me on. I'm good. I promise. Right. And so um, going into, you know, the fourth year, um, they were like, hey, Crystal, you know, we love you. We're going to give you associate producer credit and you can direct, you know, a certain amount of second unit work. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Okay, great. So I took that deal. I got it got me into the DGA. Okay, that was that was going to be my next question. Okay, gotcha. 
it got me into the DGA. The second unit work was legit. And then now coming into the last season, the fourth season, I was able to say, okay, I'm a DGA director. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not an assistant. If you guys want me to work on Greenleaf, you're going to have to hire me to direct an episode. Right. And I was like, I have another offer. So, you know, y'all need to think fast. I had no other offers. (laughs) Right. Right. I love it. And when you say, if y'all want me to work on Greenleaf, was this stepping back from the assistant position or I will, and so I'll step back and I'll only stay if I do an episode or I leave altogether and there's no nothing. It was, it, I knew that I, I, I could not be a director and an assistant at the same time. I right. could not be the assistant who suddenly was able to direct an episode and then jump back into assistant. Right. I knew that I had to leave the assistant hat behind and be the director who I know that I am. And I had to say all or nothing. I had to say, you either let me direct or I'm I'm not a part of the family at all and I'm going to go on elsewhere. Right. And, um, and, you know, they they were always on my team in terms of like wanting to see me succeed. So it wasn't, you know, it didn't get to that point where it was like, look, I'm about to, you know, it was really just like all in love. Hey, guys, you know, this is what I want to do. I have other offers on the table. I would love to remain a part of this family. I love you guys. Um, but, you know, I got to move on. You know, I got to move, right. move on up. Um, so that worked out well. And um, they brought me back to do another episode. And it was perfect, Pete, because it was like, it's, it was literally like coming off the bench, like from yeah. your home team. Like yeah. these are people who I've been working with for years and they were like all super happy for me. And, you know, it was like coming off the home bench, you know what I mean? And I, and I got out there and I literally has, have been working back to back ever since, you know? Right. Now, man, I, I got so many questions. First, congratulations on, on all of the success and what is most uh, impressive is just your commitment to it over such a long period of time. Cause as you talk about, I couldn't be an assistant for, I've been 10 years in the game. Like I did the opposite where I, I stayed out of the industry and mm-hmm. I was just making things. Cause I was like, I just need a job where I can think about it from 901 to 459. And there's nothing else that I have to do from five until nine the next morning, you yeah. know? And, yeah. uh, and, and that was kind of like, what is the, the actor's waiter version for a director? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I was, I was, not even adjacent to the industry. I just wasn't even in it. You know what I mean? Um, but you were always in it to, I guess, to me, to the people who knew you, because you were always doing something film related, you know? And I yeah. know you were like in New York and you were you were teaching and you were doing things, but it, I never felt like you were not in the industry. <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting. I, well, yeah. well, here's here's the key. I never got paid for doing my job as a director for like 20 years. So wow. anything you ever saw me do was me doing it. You know what I mean? And or and if I did get paid, like like raising money for the first feature, you know, for a seven year journey, I paid myself $15,000. So mm-hmm. do the math, you know what I mean? Right, um, <laughs> right. Hi, this is Geeta Gandavir, the executive producer and director of the HBO series Black and Missing, and you're listening to Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook is Pete Chapman's book from Michael Weezy Productions. What started in 1993 has been a marathon of persistence and creative pivots, transitioning from indie filmmaker to teaching at NYU's acclaimed film school, to running a production company, to directing television and commercials, and ultimately eyeing a return to the feature films that gave him his start. A mixture of how-to, self-help, and inspiration, this book is for any person targeting a successful career in the creative arts. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook from Michael Weezy Productions. So I want to backtrack a little bit. In your time as an assistant, 
being so close to the process, knowing that you knew what to do and had what it takes, what were maybe, I don't know, the top three things that you saw where you were like, that is going to get you, you know, talked about <laughs> as, as a director. That's going to keep you from getting invited back. You know, what are what are the things that you saw that you might even be able to share to people listening there? They're like, yo, don't do this. Oh, my goodness. There's so many things. <laughs> So many things. I mean, you know, TV and film is different. So we'll say TV, right? Because TV mm -hmm. is where the guest directors live. Um, and over the years, is what I've seen is, um, the thing is, is like, most of the time, you know, you come into this crew that's already been established. Every These people are a family. Mm -hmm. And you're coming in and they, there's a whole big picture of this whole season of this show that these people have been working at for like five or six months. And then you come in and you're all, <laughs> and you're going to be there for seven days or eight days or whatever. Right. And, um, it's, it's, it's the directors who do not understand that you are the guest and these people are the family. They are the blood, sweat, and tears of the show. They are the ones who have been sacrificing and like going through relationship issues and shit, mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to keep this job for months on end. They're the people who have been literally on set every day, Monday right. to Friday, 12, 14, 16 hours for months. Yeah. So when you come in, you have to respect that. You have to speak to these people, say thank you. You have to res you have to show them a level of respect. And it doesn't mean that you can't get what you want and say what you want and say what you mean. Because at the end of the day, like get your shot, you know, shoot your shit, like Rob Hardy mm -hmm. said. Right. But like you can't just come in like, hey, I'm the director. You do what I say and. I don't have to say hello, good morning, thank you, and good night. I don't have to say any of that because I'm the director. Like these people will work extra slow. They will, most of them go out for beers with the producers or whatever, you know, will mm -hmm. pre or whatever. But either way, right. they will trash your name. Like, yeah, right. this, this guy, I don't really like this new guy, or I don't really like this girl. She's this new director, you know, she's just da da. And, and so I try my best to like, when I, and I'm, I can't be, I'm not an overly nicey nicey to everybody. Like mm -hmm. I'm not fake with it, but I make sure that, that they know that I see them and that I respect them. And that like in the mornings, like I may not know you, but I'm going to always say, Hey, good morning. Hey, how y'all doing? Hey, what's happening? Happy Monday. Happy Friday. Because mm -hmm. Just that little bit helps. Like these people have been working their asses off. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they're about ready to strike. Like right. you gotta come in there <laughs> and be happy and be thankful. <laughs> like, you know, oh, that's so so true. just that simple. Like I've seen just rude directors, um, directors who don't say good morning or thank you, or they just come in and, and do it. And they may do an amazing job, but nobody, mm -hmm. everybody hated working with them. Right. Um, you know, I've seen, I think, I feel like also from a producer standpoint, the overall bigger picture again of the show, you know, you know, like as someone who's always there, you know, and I'm dibbling into the producing director thing now, but you know what all the issues are. You, mm -hmm. this is your family, you know, the rent might not got paid last month. <laughs> you know, right. y'all barely made the rent this month. And then you got this, you got this new director who comes in like, well, I don't give a shit about the rent. This right. is the shot I want. And this is the, this is the location that I want and whatever. And that's another way to not get asked back. Um, yeah. It's not necessarily that you have to completely just compromise on everything but you do have to take into account that these people are have been producing a show for months before you got there and they're gonna have to produce that show for months after you leave. Mm -hmm. And if you come in and fuck shit up, 
you know, part of my French, but it's like you that no matter what the amazing job that you do after you're gone and we're stuck there with like scheduling issues because you didn't right. make it with your days or like you know budget issues now we got to take this from this next director because you went two hundred thousand dollars over on this location or whatever the case may be that's what's gonna rattle around and people's right. brains after you leave not like oh my god his that one shot though that he got or that episode right. was great it's gonna be like damn okay now we're two hundred thousand dollars over let's see how we can recoup that with this and then we got to figure out the schedule for that it's a whole nother you know and, and for four thing. weeks after you left as director they still are experiencing your <laughs> the yes. wake of what you left behind sometimes and, it goes on for months like right. after you right. leave, that trickle, that domino effect ended right. up messing up. Like you did episode two and now we're on episode five and we're still dealing with the shit because, because right. things have to go somewhere. Everything right. has to go somewhere else, you know? Right. You can't well, just think, create space and time, you know? I've, I've seen that, you know, and I don't, and I, I don't always know how those issues arose but i've definitely gotten places where it's like oh i'm i'm now paying for the 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 sins of my father <laughs> you know what i mean like uh, and that exactly. father was in episode two um well let let's talk about this pivot now to producing director um you are co-ep and producing director on queens on abc um, I am super interested in this uh, combo, as I told you, because I'm in a very similar situation, actually the exact same one, where, um, you know, I'm producing awesome. director. I know. Thank you for, for this show, Reasonable Doubt, for Hulu. Um, the pilot on this one's directed by Kerry Washington. The pilot on Queens was directed by Tim Story. Mm -hmm. And so here you are now, right, coming into this family. Um, and you are uh, kind of not at the head of the table, but you're you're there when everybody's left and going to bed, and you're talking with other, you know, uh, yep. stakeholders in the kitchen as you clean up the meal. Um, just kind of talk about what this job is, and then I'll probably have a, a bunch of questions for you, as like you know what you've learned and what you've done and 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 uh, experienced over the past. Um, what, since about September? Um, August. <clears throat> August? Okay. Yep, since about August, because I feel like, yeah, yep, August. But yeah, um, it's everything, Pete. This job is everything. It's, it's, it's thinking about all of it, everything, um, <laughs> in a way that I never have before. Um, I think that every producing director job is different. I think it just mm -hmm. is all going to depend on like the dynamics of the set that you're on and, and what's happening. For me, um, oh my goodness, I don't even know where to start because you have you have the producing and then you have the directing. I'll start with directing. Okay. Um, directing as a producing director, um, I began to say things that I never thought I would hear myself say um, mm -hmm. in terms of like, you know, when you're just directing, it's all about the story. It's all about the creative. It's all about what I can possibly do. And I found myself being like, well, I do love this location more, but I understand I'm going to get more bang for my book here. Um, I do want this episode to be on pattern I do want my hot cost to be right. Like that's the well, type can of you can you define those? So pattern is the expected budget per episode, yes. right? Predetermined yes. with all with the studio and the network. Yes. And then what are hot costs? The hot costs come in every day, and it's whether you're over or under your daily projected budget. So like, if you go over an hour, your hot costs are gonna reflect that you went over an hour. If you come in under 30 minutes, your hot costs are gonna say, oh, she saved us $12,000 today. You know what I mean? And um, when you see those things as a producer and you're actually directing the show, you know, 
you start to think of it as like, okay, I need to direct this in a way that can can help everyone succeed. There's a whole bigger picture versus like coming in as a guest director and knowing that you have to knock out this amazing episode or these two episodes. And you're just trying to do that and make your mark and go. But as a producing director, it pr the producing portion of it did greatly like impact my decisions as a director. And, you know, and that's okay. Cause you don't always have to compromise uh, creativity for time. Not always. Right. right. Um, or like sometimes you could, you know, you could go for the, for the less expensive location and still bring something amazingly great out of it. You know what I mean? So right. it's, it's not always like, Oh, you know, I had to sacrifice, but you know, the directing portion of it, you, you are keeping it in mind. Um, the overall like issues that are happening with your show. Cause your, your producing partners are there like, Hey, we're over budget here. Or, Hey, we have this problem or, Hey, this actor, whatever the case is. Um, and are they looking to you to then have some kind of um, diplomatic conversation with the current director about how to not continue these overages or how to not continue these uh, this coverage that is not maybe in in line with what we want. And then I'm, I'm firing so many questions at you. And then like how much oh, of that is even like on the DP? Like, is it the DP's job to protect the look? Or if the look is off in a particular scene, do you have to be like, yo, that's not how we shoot that? Like, who, where does, who swoops in? Yeah, well, a lot of different people sometimes swoop in, but the, 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 what I will say is usually a DP on a TV show, you know, like they're just going to shoot it the way that they, the, the, the way that you shoot it, the way that the show looks. Mm -hmm. And a good DP is not just going to let you go completely off the rails and do something right. that's not the show. Um, so that's a good thing. So I don't have to worry about that too much. What I mainly have to worry about is, when I, you know, I'm thinking about time, I know we can't go over 12, 13 hours max. Mm -hmm. And when I start to see the way that a director is rehearsing a scene and you start to see that the blocking is, may get a little cumbersome, mm -hmm. like this is gonna take an extra setup. That's gonna be an extra 45 minutes. Are you sure you can, you have time for this? It's those, those to me, those are the hardest conversations to have because I am a director. So I understand like their need to be creative and, and free, mm -hmm. but I'm also, I have to keep things on track. So it's like, you know, it's about knowing the right time to step in. And for me, it's after rehearsal is over. Um, sometimes it's beforehand, but for me, it's after I see what they're going to do. And if I have mm -hmm. anything, any pressing question that I'm like, you sure you want her to come in from over there? Because you know that's going to add an extra 45 minutes set up. Just uh -huh. making sure, uh -huh. like, you, you know, would it be the same if she came in from the other door? Like, what's your reason? And if the director is very passionate about, like, no, she has to come in from this door. because This is the way to do And I set up the whole act. And it's like, okay cool you know and then you just try to figure out other ways to make sure that they have all the time that they need um but having those tough conversations is a part of the job of like okay you know if you go in for this overhead crane shot you're probably going to lose a setup in your next right. scene because you you're running out of time you right. know what I mean? yeah it's you know and it's have you found any diplomacy tricks you know because like is are you asking in that fashion like are you sure you want to do something or like or or what's your plan like you know what I mean like it's, it's I, tough because director they 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 know the shit right they know what you what they already know what you're trying to say so right. I try to be as straightforward as possible because like right. if I try to I feel like if I try to dance around it is right. going to be like, what, Crystal? What are you trying to say to me? Right. So I, I think I just go in straight and be like, hey, so um, I noticed you have her coming in from over there. I know that's going to be at least an extra hour. Just straight right. up. 
You know what I mean? Right. So I'm just trying to, and sometimes they have a plan like, well, actually I'm not going to cover that. Or I only need one size on this, or I'm only mm-hmm. going to grab this in the wide shot. Then you know what they're thinking because right. guess what your boss, like the, the bigger producer is going to come along when shit is running late and be like, right. what's happening? What's going on? What's he doing? What's she doing? Right. Then you, right. you have to be able to say, Oh, you know, once she turns around, it's going to go quick because she only has one size and da, da, da. So, so you have to discuss the plan with your director when you see that something might take way too long than it needs to take. You have to mm-hmm. at least see like, so I know, so, you know, are, are you doing two sizes on everybody? This is a five person scene at a dinner table. Like I noticed you did two sizes on her. Do you need two sizes on every character? Like you right. have to know this stuff. And if they yeah. need it, they need it. Like, I don't like to cut their their coverage, you know, right. say, unless it's just really something that's unnecessary. But like, um, but like if they need it, they need it. But at least you know what it is that they need and you can try right. to anticipate on how to help them, you know, get it. Are you requiring them to provide you with a, a plan, whether blocking or shot list, or are you... Or is the show kind of finding this out on the day? Yeah, I some directors, like I had one director who gave me a shot list before her episode. Um, but I don't find that that is necessarily always better. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that I like directors who can think on their feet on the day. Because mm-hmm. sometimes stuff just happens in the morning. A, an actor was late or a wig got left at home or whatever the case right, is. Right, right, right. And then you still have to get in there and figure out like, okay, how are we going to make this day? This took longer than we expected. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I feel like those directors um, kind of fare better than the directors who had it all planned out. Because right. the ones who had it all planned out to a T, they're less likely to deviate from that plan And it's Mm -hmm. like, well, this is the way that I saw this scene and this is the way that it has to go. And it's like, I understand that, but you got 30 minutes. So what you gonna do? You know what I mean? Like, I, you know, so it's, it's tough, but yeah, I don't, I don't have anyone do any shot lists or anything. I will, like, if there's a big scene, like, you know, usually in these episodic scripts, there's, Mm -hmm one dinner party or there's right. like the part where the, they get into the car accident or there's the part where the, the boat blows up. <laughs> I always right. talk to them about like their big, you know, scene or anything that's good that I know. It's like, right. so what's your plan for that? Like, how you feeling about it? You know, is there anything I can do, you know, just to see like what they're thinking, give them a soundboard. Mm-hmm. But I mainly just talk to the directors about, I like to talk to them about the actors and how the actors like to work. Mm-hmm. Cause I feel like that's a bit of a shortcut. Like don't, yeah. you know, why send them in there and let them figure it out. Like just let them know, hey, this actor loves to do their cover second. This right. actor is this way. And, you know, just, I like to just give them tips on how to kind of skip stuff they don't have to figure out themselves and take more time or right um but it's I think that's that's the hardest part for me about it it has been when you have a director who really wants to shoot the scene a certain way Mm -hmm. and it's like I understand what you're trying to do but how can we do this in this amount of time right um you know so yeah, it's it's, it's interesting because I I've I found that I've had uh, increasingly I've been I've been met with prep calendars that tell me I have a shot list meeting on a particular day. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and and I'm like, okay, that's cool. I get that, and and I respect that. What I what I'll do though is I like I'll be like, well, I'll I'll let, we'll schedule that when I'm ready to. Yeah. Because like if we're you there, who says I'm ready on day three to even talk about this, right? right. Um, and so I have been thinking about having, you know, I have a whole little document that I'm preparing for the directors that they'll get a little bit before they arrive. That's just like inclusive of like, here's how it's going to unfold. And one of those things is uh, you'll have 
Um, in the second half of your eight day prep, you will schedule at your convenience a meeting with the AD to go over your you know, scene plan to make sure that this schedule reflects what you need. And it's, ho and it's kind of a roundabout way maybe of getting that conversation on, on paper and out in, the, in concrete of like, you know, sometimes you, they, the AD has two hours for a scene. You're like, I got that an hour, no doubt. Right. Um, and I, I'd rather put that hour here so sometimes it's just a, a better time management thing, but other times it might reveal like, oh, you want the big equipment on this scene. Um, we need to, you know, think about how we accomplish that. Yeah. But, you know, I'll, it'll be, a, I'll report back to you how it works. <laughs> no, I, I like that because most of the time, like, you know, the person who does the prep schedule is like an AD like maybe the second AD who's just trying to kind of like get it done, you know what I mean? Right, or right. so much stuff is up in the air and it's like, okay, I'm just going to put these meetings on the schedule and they'll just get moved around. And I think that as long as like when, I think that your directors will respond well to that because they know somebody somewhere thinking about it, thinking about mm -hmm. my process. Right. And right. not just throwing me in, in here, like, okay, meeting, 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 meeting. You know, right. someone is there to think about my process. And I think that's been my one of my favorite things about being a producing director is being there for the directors and letting them right. know, like, hey, I'm here. I'm thinking about your process. Um, I got your back. Like, there was, um, to, be, to be specific, um, there was one particular scene with a character, and it was audio only. It was like they were they were expressing something on the news, but we were never mm -hmm. to see this character. We were only going to hear him. And they had it scheduled for post-production. And um, I was like, hey, I talked to the director. I was like, do you want to be a part of, don't you want to be a part of this like voice? You know, I know it's all audio, but do you want to be a part of that? And she was like, absolutely. You right. know, it's still a character who's emoting something in a scene on right. my episode. And like, if if you leave it up to post-production to do it, it's going to yeah. be like, okay, we got good levels. You know what I mean? Right, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, so I made sure that she was going to be a part of that. And, um, you know, as a director, I see that like, wait, this is over here. The director needs to know that. But as a producer or as someone who has so much going on, you might not even look, right. see, or care, you know? Right. You make um, a good point, though. Like, there's so much, you know, like, you get you get your prep schedule sometimes, and uh, it's clearly been thought out, but sometimes you'll see, like, one of the names is wrong, and it's the previous director, because there is a sense of plug and play to keep the assembly line moving. And yeah. someone is, at some point in the day, just updating the document yeah, yeah exactly and it's like you know to have you to have us there to protect that director's experience is great um yeah. what is so that's for your kind of personal um experience directing you have these other things that kind of uh are top of mind that might not have been um as much before you're navigating um uh, that collaboration with the shooting director to get through this process and um, kind of make it work for production, but also make it work for them. Mm -hmm. What is it like if I'm, uh, if you can speak briefly, like to, I'm hired, I'm, I'm doing episode 113 as an example. I show up in prep. What's it like with you? Like, what do you do for that prepping director? Um, and I guess I, I really, what's your day like? Because I, I, I assume you're in a van, but then you got to get back to the stage and you got to go. It's a pivotal scene. So you got to have, you got to be there in Video Village. You know what I mean? Like, what does it look like when you have so many hats on? You you look busy. You look busy. <laughs> you no, know, there's always something to do. There's always somewhere to go. Um, even if you're directing that day, if you're directing a second unit or if you have a whole day that you got to do, if there's another unit shooting, you need to go and be present. Um, you're expected to be there. What I realize is that depending on the dynamics of your show, 
Um, and more than likely, this will be you because if your pilot director or the person doing the first episode is one person and you're a different person, that person is going to leave and you'll be there. And depending on if your showrunner is on the ground all the time, if the producers are on the ground all the time, that's one thing. But if it's just really kind of you and your showrunner pops in and out and your producers kind of pop in and out or they're working from afar or they're working from LA, what I realized psychologically is that the crew and the cast need that person. They need that leader to look to and say, this is the person who's making sure that we're okay. This is the person who's just not gonna let it go off the rails. This is the person I can come to if I have an issue or whatever. So you, mm -hmm. so there's a, there was a part of me that had to step into that audibly and let the cast and crew know, hey guys, good morning. I'm Crystal, I'm here, I'm your producing director, I'm here for you. I even let them know, I started as a PA and I worked my way up. I know what each and every one of you are going through. This was around the time that the strike was pending. Right. Right. And so I had to really step up and out and be that audible leader to say, hey guys, you know, I'm here. Um, and my other producers would do it as well when they were there, but that was really important. And it was something I didn't realize was needed um, uh -huh. until I got into it. And I realized, wait, like these people's morale, the way they come to work, how fast they work, how enjoyable they, you know, they, they, they work is all up to the leadership. Right. So that's first and foremost is making sure that like you have a presence on set and around these people so that they know like, OK, Pete's got my back. I can go to him with it with a problem, you know, and then once you do that, your day starts to look like sometimes someone comes to you with a problem <laughs> like, because you said you can come talk to me about anything and then they will do that. They'll come to you and talk to you about things. It's funny you say that. I, I did that for an actor and we have a mutual friend and a mutual friend said, you know, you said that they could ask you anything and they wanted to ask you about like all these questions because it's their first big TV thing. And I was like, I did say that. Yes. I did, exactly. <laughs> I did say I'll call, that. Will, I'll call them tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, they will come with the coupon, with the uh, cash in and be like, hey, so I'm having this issue. And sometimes you find yourself dealing with things that you never thought that you would have to deal with, but they're affecting your day and they're yes. affecting the hours and they're affecting or they're affecting this particular department. And now this department isn't as efficient and that's going to interrupt your day or make right. your day go longer. And your producer hat is there saying, we got to wrap in 12, 13 hours. Mm -hmm. You better figure this out. Your, your director brain is over here like, oh, that's going to be a cool shot. I really want them to be able to get the crane because it's going to open up this episode or whatever. Right, right. And, you know, your personal person is in there like, damn, these people have been working X amount mm. of overtime and like, we got to get this crew to fuck out of here. You know, right. there's so many different things. And, and so you end up like, my day sometimes starts in base camp. Um, I, I'm a producing director of a show with four leading beautiful women. They mm -hmm. all always have to be beautiful on screen. Um, so some days if someone doesn't like their hair or someone doesn't like their wardrobe or someone's trying to figure something out, mm -hmm. my day will start in base camp. Um, and that will come to you, not the showrunner or, or, or is your example, your showrunner is in LA, is in LA and you shoot yeah, LA. like. If, right. so if my children is in LA, if he is if he is on the ground, sometimes I like to handle the smaller petty things because I know he mm -hmm. has a lot to do. I know he's probably trying to get the next script out right. or he's on a notes call with the studio and he doesn't have time right. to come down and deal with like the fact that so-and-so's hair, she doesn't like her new wig or whatever. You know what I mean? Because right. right. sometimes they need to be told that they're beautiful. 
They need to be, you know, actors need to be safe and confident. Sometimes it's just someone saying, I love what you have. I love what right. you look like. I think it looks great on you. And they're like, really? You think so? Yeah, I think it looks yeah. wonderful. This is what the showrunner also liked. You look amazing. And mm -hmm. then sometimes that's all they need to be like, okay, okay, well, maybe if I just do a belt with it, it'll be fine. You're like, yeah, just girl, put on a belt. Let's go shoot. <laughs> it's going to be great. Let's, let's go shoot. <laughs> as, as I point to my watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, but so you can do that. But you also, you can't bullshit too much because you have to tell the truth as right. well. If they look stupid, you got to tell them like, no, right. we got to change this because right. they have to keep that trust in you to know that like, okay, Pete's not going to just let me go on screen looking any kind of way because he's trying to make right. his day. He's right. going to be honest so that the next time it happens, you can say, no, no, no. I promise you look great. You look fine. Mm -hmm. And they'll trust mm -hmm. to say, okay, great. Y'all all right, great. let's go, let's do it, you know? Right. And sometimes it's just that. Sometimes it's um, it's anything. It's any little thing that can happen. Um, right. That, that, that once a leader shows up to say, hey, here's what we need to do. Sometimes that's all that's needed. And right. then, cause you had different crew members start to talk about what they think should happen. And I think, yep. it should be this, and I think it should be that. Well, this person's feeling this way. And then you're at a stalemate cause everyone's right. there talking about it. And they literally just need you to step in and be like, hey, let's do this. Okay, Almost well, like vice president, like a tying vote in the Senate, yeah. you know, <laughs> but, the, but the showrunner is president, right? Is, um, yes, yes. What does, at the end of each day, um, do you stay till the final shot until wrap? Do you judge it by the nature of the scene? Like, what's your? How do you? How do you determine when yeah. you leave? Because you're doing so many jobs, you also need to get home. Yeah, I mean, me personally, I stay to the last shot. But there have been some times that I didn't. Um, where I was tired or I knew I wanted to go on an early scout the next day. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm not going to stay late tonight because I'm going on this 8 a.m. scout in the morning or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you kind of just play it by ear. But what I found is that anytime, sometimes when I say, well, they got it, I can go home. That's when some, some stuff happens, you know? <laughs> and right specifically for me, because a lot of times I'm on set, I'm the producer on set. Um, then it's like, if I'm not there, who's there, you know what I right. mean? So right. if there are other producers present on set and I have like an early morning or like the scene is super, I'm like, okay, y'all, I'm gonna catch out. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna head on home. That's fine. But like, sometimes it's the smallest little stupid scenes Right. That you think are going to be all fine and they're not. So I yeah. like to say, um, I like to be there for, because you'll find your actors will get very dependent on your presence sometimes. Mm. You, you're mm -hmm. that person who's always there making them feel safe. Every other new director who comes in, they're a new director, they're a new person Right. You know, and you're there to say, okay, Pete is there. Everything's okay. And sometimes it's mm -hmm. just your presence there in Video right. Village saying, you're doing great. That was an right. amazing take. This is a great scene. They they need that, you know. How many episodes are you directing? Uh, do you have a, do you have a, what's your order? Is it? I did two. So. Okay. So I did four and I did seven. Okay. Yeah. And what's and the total uh, episode order? It's um 13. Okay. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, Tim Story did the pilot, the first two episodes. And I know Kerry Washington's doing yours, which is very exciting. Um, so that's also interesting because some producing directors are the pilot directors or the first, right? Or, or they kind of set the tone for the show and then they keep that tone. Right. Um, so for people like us, it's it's a little bit different because you're the first director obviously is going to set the the tone and mm -hmm. then you still have to kind of keep that going 
you you're right. not trying to keep it. You have to keep it going. But from but you're a different director with different you know sensibilities. So and the, and the demands are extremely different because our like our pilot was 14 days. We will have nine days to shoot. So it becomes like it becomes what's logistically possible while being creatively amplified while being realistic. You know what I mean? Like, because that's that means, you know, fewer takes. Um, it means more pages per day. And you've yeah. got to really find a way to communicate whatever the true essence of that pilot vision is. How do you take that? and you know replicate it it's like if you if you're known for if you patty labelle and you're making pies at home how do you make those pies for everybody because you can't cook them the same way you know what i mean you can't because patty patty left and now like you know what i mean patty's not here to make the pie now we got sue in here making the pie how do we make the pie taste the same yeah and look the same um and, um, you know, it's, I think it's harder on some shows than it is on others. I think some shows have such a specific look and style mm-hmm. and feel to them mm-hmm. that it probably becomes a bit more, you know, um, my show Queens, it's an ABC show. There's a very sort of like straightforward connection with the characters that our showrunner and our pilot director set for right. it's like, they're interested in being right up close and personal with these people. They don't want something over here behind, the, you know what I mean? They, they want to mm-hmm. connect like straight on with people. And, and I think, like you said, it's about the essence. It's about finding out like, so what is it really about? Is it really about connection? Is it really about, is that why you want the tighter eye lines? Right. You know, like, what is it? Um, and once you find that out, then you're able to, to kind of speak to that with your directors. Um, um, but yeah, it's 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 a very it's a tightrope walk, and you're juggling two or three different things. Um, it's right. a really challenging job. It's a challenging job, but it's very fulfilling because it's very challenging and you'll step right. in and do things that you didn't know you could do or that you've never done before. And you realize the weight of your word or the weight of your um, input is something that like could save our day or, right. or you know what I mean? Save well, the our beauty of it, the, Another beauty of it too, in this world of, um, I, I, I'll say in this industry world of hierarchy, right? And 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 what you've done being proof of what you can do. Once you have this producing director title, this co-executive producer credit, it is, it's now saying Crystal is a director who can bring a vision to a project, can can maintain a vision to a project and should be considered in that way. Mm-hmm. So whether it's another show where now they're like, no, she's going to do the pilot and leave or be, do the pilot and be the producing director. Like it's it's a nice thing from which there's no turning back, you know, because um, yeah. we unfortunately don't have that same uh, uh, totem pole like writers do, where it's like you do a job a certain amount of times and then you never go back to it. Like you, your staff, right, your, 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 your. Uh, God, what is it? Um, I forget something. And then you're staff writer and then you're a writer and you're a co-EP and then like, and then you, but you never go back. Um, and this is the one like elevation for us as directors. Um, yeah. Which is yeah. dope. I haven't asked you about post. That's my uh, one remaining question right. on, on this job. Um, do you weigh in on all the cuts? Like, how does that, how does that work now um, in this position for you? Yeah, so that's also something that I think varies from job to job. Me mm-hmm. on, on Queens, I did not. Mm-hmm. And I was sort of thankful for that because my job got very, very demanding, especially towards the middle of the season. And um, there would have been no way, like, mm-hmm. I had enough on my plate just delivering my episodes (laughs) that I did my cuts. Um, 
and staying on top of everything day to day. So it was a bit of a blessing that like, even though like, you know, I love the show and I want to see the cuts, it was a bit of a blessing that that wasn't expected of me to like turn around notes on every cut. Um, My showrunner and my lead producer, executive producer were heavily or heavily involved in that. And that's great because it's like the showrunner gets what he wants, you know what I mean? And you don't have to right. worry about like a difference in opinion or anything. Um, however, I have worked with producing directors before where that solely fell on them and mm-hmm. they were always in post, always doing cuts all the time. Um right. And, you know, they would just do it um, as often as possible. It would literally be like, okay, while we do this setup, I'm going to run to the trailer, watch a little bit of this cut. um, And assistant is there typing your notes out. And you're just able to say like, hey, trim this, do that. Um, So I have seen, and it gets to be really, really, really busy for people like producing directors who do post. Right. Um, but yeah, but I didn't have to do that on, on this show. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, so two folded questions. What's next for you? Um, if you can specifically talk about it and, or like, what are you looking to do next? You know, uh, cause it seems like you're a woman who pivots and elevates and moves on to the things that are, are that, that she's passionate about. Like, how would you answer those two questions? Thank you, Pete. That's exactly what I'm, that's exactly who I am. Like, I'm always looking for that thing that's going to fulfill me creatively, mentally, all of that. And um, I think that what I really want to do next, um, I definitely want to do a feature film. Um, TV has kind of worn me out a little bit. It gets to be a lot of work, as you know. Um <laughs> going from show to show, traveling, always um, relearning new crews and new people. It was great working on Queens um, because it's my family. And then I know, you know, I know these people, but just going from show to show to show, I'm kind of like, I would love to see something through from beginning to end as a director. Visually, I would love to do that. I, you know, I want to I want to shoot cinematic um, things. I want to shoot very creative things. When I, when I first started doing shorts, most of my shorts, if not most of them, 90% of them were sci-fi, experimental, quirky, you know, and I feel like I haven't had a chance to really express that voice as a professional director yet, because I've been in television so I need to do that. I'm going to have to um, right. express myself, you know, at some point. Um, so I'm excited about that. And I'm also a writer. Um, I have a couple of things in development um, that have been in development for a while. So pro- hopefully this year you'll start to see those things come to the forefront because we've been working on them for so long. Um right. So I'm also excited about that. I'm just a storyteller at the end of the day. And as long as I can tell like great stories, some be somewhere telling some good stories, I'm good. You know what I mean? So, but I, I do want to kind of like, I, I don't want to burn myself out. So I think finding that balance between mm-hmm. um, writing and choose being a little bit more choosy about the projects that I choose to direct. I yeah. have to do that, you know, for myself, this is, sanity, everything. This is the time. That was that was like the, the first pivot for me, which was, okay, like, it looks like people want to hire me year, year after year. Now I need to be more discerning about the things that I actually really want to do. Um, and then also I started going directly at people. Like, I want to direct for your show. Can I have a meeting? Um, nice. And, and, a, a lot of last year's work was was just that for three shows, That's like what I was really amped to do. Um, but then, yeah, it's like you gotta you gotta manage the time because it, it'll have you all over the country and it'll have you up every day. And you know, yeah, we, and we and your family will never see you. Your loved ones right. will never talk to you. 
Right. Um, but your bank account will look nice. Right. But, you know, it's that. And and then right. before you know it, you know, you have to like, you know, because it's like I was getting momentum. I was getting momentum. And it's like, okay, we got momentum. Now I have to steer this thing in the direction right. that I want it to go. I can't just let it go. Right. And just right. See where right. I end up. You know, <laughs> it's like be honest with I would just say like you have to be honest with yourself about what you really want to do. Cause if you're trying to do this for the rest of your life, mm-hmm. you can't just fake it forever. You can't, you can't do something you're not that interested in forever. Cause after it, right. it, it doesn't, <laughs> it's too right. hard. It takes too right. long and too much. Right. So like, Get on the track on the road that you really want to be on so that you can go that next 20 years, 30 right. years in the game, you know? Front yeah. loaded with with getting there and 10 years as an assistant or 15 years doing stuff unpaid, but then mm-hmm. you have a have a have an end target. Um so the the last the, the final thing is I like to ask what three things, uh, what three qualities do you think? are necessary to make it in this industry? Uh, And then the final question is, what would you tell your younger self? Um, Okay, so three things. I would say, look, my old mentor, rest rest in peace, um, Fred Morris, um, he was a Jewish guy. He used to tell me uh, to have chutzpah. Mm-hmm. And like, that's the first thing that came to my head was like chutzpah. And I was like, what's chutzpah? And it's basically balls. It's yeah. it's the ability to stand on your two feet and say, this is my idea to, to be able to express your vision unapologetically, to be able to go after what you want aggressively and be like, mm-hmm. actually, no, I'm a director and this is what I do. Um, because no one's going to believe in you more than you believe in you. So if you kind of halfway believe in yourself, nobody else really is either. Um, so I would say that's probably the first thing you got to be brave and like face, like face failure, face, like the possibility that like you can mess up your whole career and like, uh, and like one decision, that's fine. You got to face it and take it and do it anyway. Um, you know, so like you, you definitely can't make it too as far as you want without having that. And I would say, um, you know, just persistence, um, over the long course of it. Cause I think that sometimes people think like, it's a quick thing. I can get rich overnight or all you got to do is shoot a film. And then these people did it. And it's like, yeah, great. It's great for those people. But what if your journey is 10 years or 15 or 20 or 25? Right. Are you right. still going to love it? Are you still going to be there? And you got to be there no matter what that answer is. Like no matter how many years it says, you know, is your destiny to to try and break through. Right. Are you going to just, you got to be persistent and do it until it happens. Um Because if you give up before it happens, it'll never happen, obviously. Um, And then I think chutzpah, persistence, and um, you know what I'm going to say that I probably have never said before, but I will say self-care. I will say self-care. I think that if you can take care, know how to take care of yourself, you can make it in this business. I think that you have to mentally take care of yourself. You, you have to physically eat the right things so that you can mm-hmm. withstand those long hours so that your brain isn't foggy, so that you can, you know, express your ideas in a clear and concise way so that people know what to do. Um, if you're like half drunk, half high, really unhealthy, you know, right. barely able to make it through the day, or even mentally, if you're still holding on to old baggage and now you don't trust yourself and you're not confident in your ideas or whatever the case is, you got to clear all of that shit up and you have to really focus on a a portion of your life that is dedicated to taking care of yourself. Um, Yourself is what is going to go out here and do all these amazing things. And if you're not taking care of that, then it's like, 
you're you're battling against you know yourself um so yeah. i would say self care has become a huge part of my life just in trying to do this um and i don't think i would have made it had i not taken mm. certain steps to become you know better mentally emotionally physically spiritually um you know and i think a lot of times people don't think that that's a big part of the job but it is it totally right. is and there will come a point when you will be forced to reckon with how important it is. So figure it out early, people. Yeah. <laughs> Don't figure it out now. Yeah, figure it's, it out now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Crystal, for yeah. popping on to the pod. It's a long time coming. We were talking about doing this. Uh, well, this will air, I guess, in 2022. We were talking about doing this early in 2021. 2021. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... It's a great way to close out the year. Um, happy New Year to you and yours. Um, and, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been, it's always amazing talking to you, my brother. You've always been, you know, just um, a shining light and you've always gotten out there in ways to encourage people and show people the way to, to go. Congrats on the book and everything. Keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Keep doing what you're doing. What's up, people? This is Pete Chapman. Follow me on Instagram and on Twitter via at Pete Chapman. Follow the pod on Facebook on our Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman official page and hit up our mailbag with questions, suggestions, or hey, donations if you're feeling like it via Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman at gmail.com. And just in case you need to know how to spell it, that's Pete with the last name C-H-A-T-M-O-N. And thank you all for tuning in to episode 33 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. That, of course, was Crystal C. Roberson. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. Next week, we will have the indomitable Kelly Edwards. Uh, her book, The Executive Chair uh, from Michael Weezy Productions, is available. And it is a writer's guide to TV series development. And uh, so we get into we get into the into the weeds with that. Um, also, Kelly's been a mentor of mine. She ran the HBO All Access program uh, that I was in in 2016. And uh, you know, we get to chop it up and then see how things have been over the past uh, couple of years with what she's been doing. So, hope you all enjoy. As always, stay safe, spread love, and keep creating. <laughs>